<laughs> All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Alexandra Schneider. I'm the manager of visitor services and public programs for the History Center of Lake Forest Lake Bluff. Uh, really pleased to have a special program tonight to highlight not only local history, but to talk about some more mapping, which is our special exhibit at the moment. Um, before we get into our program, however, a little bit of uh, housekeeping as per usual. If I've not already done so, I ask that you please mute your microphone since we have a pretty decent group on tonight and that'll cut down on any ambient noise. Also, you'll see in the top right hand portion of your screen, a little view button. You wanna go ahead and select speaker view so you see whomever is talking nice and big and bright. Um, I also wanna say really quickly, a thank you to Maddie Dugan who makes our Zoom programming possible, very generous. Um, of her to be uh, to support us as we continue to sort of transition between virtual and in-person programs and also to the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation for co-presenting this program with us. Uh, in terms of the program itself tonight, we're very excited to have Art Miller back yet again to share more of his expertise. I'm sure through the course of the program, you'll have a lot of really um, wonderful questions to ask Art. So if you have a burning question, you can use the chat box at the bottom of your screen. There's a little chat icon and you can click on that. And um, if you wanna direct your questions to Carol Summerfield, she will go ahead and be moderating questions at the end of the program. Um, with that, uh, I just want to introduce our speaker for this evening. Art Miller has worn many hats through his career. He was a founding member and a past president of our former iteration, the Lake Forest Lake Bluff Historical Society. He was also uh, the college archivist and librarian for special collections at Lake Forest College and a former president of the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation. He is a very prolific author of many articles about the local area and are sort of our go-to guy for all things Lake Forest. So we're very excited to have him on this evening to be speaking about Lake Forest's curvilinear plan. And with that, Art, I will turn it over to you. I'm, I'm only gonna take um, about 15 minutes now. Um, am I, can you turn it over to me? Okay, good. You're, you're good. I'm only um, gonna take about 15 minutes or se seconds at this point to speak briefly um, about setting this up. I'm going to give a first little housekeeping thing. I see that my computer has frozen already, um, which I'm not quite sure why, since the Apple people told me it wouldn't. Um, but if I have to move to a different um, device, you know, I'll be back in a second anyway. The slides are going to be handled by Alex at her end. And I'm just going to hold up this little game. This is a game called Set. See the bright colors? Um, it's a visual family game of visual perception and a little bit of what I'm going to do today to make it, I hope it make it a little bit amusing too, is I'm going to show a series of maps and show some primary colors and try to show, to see if we can see how some of the forms of um, street plans and picturesque landscapes progress, um, how they got started before they got to Lake Forest, then how they developed and then how they um, affected others and, and, and finally got built out in Lake Forest. So without further ado, um, back to you for the screen and we'll start the PowerPoint. So back, yes, right there, that's good. So um, Lake Forest, this is about the 1857 plan by Almer and Hotchkiss that we talked about the other uh, week and uh, that's now at the Newberry Library. Um, it was by St. Louis-based Elmer and Hotchkiss. Um, oh, the uh, 1857 plan's origins and earlier pictorial and picturesque landscapes are part of the, um, are, with their curvilinear roadways are um, the first part of it. And then we'll go on and talk about the, the 1850s and 1860s impact on later planning, both in town and beyond. Next slide, please. So this is the this is a picture of the uh, the originally the first time that the Lake Foresters actually themselves published their plan in 1869. Even though it was it was registered in Waukegan, 
1857, they were, um, I guess we would say secretive. They didn't especially want to advertise either that they were rich or that they had African Americans living in their backyard who weren't exactly legal. Yes, they were. So, so um, this uh, this was this brochure was done finally to try to attract um, students for the Lake Forest Academy and for the Ferry Hall Women's also two prep programs. Uh, it was a small town of winding streets. that um, was the culmination of a long progression of picturesque plans. Um, it was a link in the development of high tech transport enabled access to suburban middle camp, middle landscapes. Even so, um, the, the Wikipedia article on Riverside, very interestingly, now this is Wikipedia, anybody can put it in there. It cites um, Oz, that, um, that Oz, Amstead designed Riverside, that this is obviously, or this is arguably the first community designed in the, in the United States. Uh, this is in price, imprecise on a couple of levels, many levels, but particularly here in the progression of suburbs that were accessed by steam-driven modes of transport. Next slide. So here we'll start out with straight lines. Straight lines were dominant in the late 17th century Enlightenment era landscape and town planning. Showed here is uh, King Louis XIV of France's Versailles, southwest of Paris. The park was designed by Le Nôtre and um, its angled paths and roadways are, were inspiring for Wren's Hampton Court outside London, Haussmann's um, Avenues in Paris and boulevards, and L'Enfant's late 18th century Washington, D.C. So we, we've, we see this all around us in uh, modern cities. Note the crow's foot arterial plan at the bottom with the roadways converging on the palace in the upper plan radiating out from the central axis, uh, both two places, converging on the palace at the bottom and at the top, um, actually um, radiating out from the main axis. Um, next slide. So this, now I'm going back in time to the, to the 18th century across the globe in China. Uh, the summer palace at Beijing, uh, this was destroyed in the 19th century, but in the mid 18th century, it was um, a fantastic palace. Um, the lake is man-made entirely. Uh, the palace grounds have curvilinear roadways that look a lot like Lake Forest. And they were inspired, and those went on to inspire English landscape design style. Um, British and French people visiting in China, doing business there, brought these ideas back to Europe. Next slide. Uh, the Sturhead Estate, Wilshire, England, after 1735, had curvilinear Chinese pathways around a series of lakes and ponds. Um, the dot at the bottom, you can just barely see a little dot there, kind of in a circle. Uh, that's the high point, uh, kind of on a hill, of a Temple of Apollo with a vista up the lake from there. So it was very picturesque and very Chinese with the Chinjin grape. Next slide. Now this is an idealized English garden um, with all the best elements uh, done in, this is written in French obviously, but um, the, if you look to the lower right, you'll see, um, a, actually best you'll see a main bridge, uh, curving landscape, lots of little rock gatherings, and noticeably a big pagoda sticking up in that lower left, <laughs> central left. Um, next slide. So this is a bigger park. This is a real park. This is Moscow. Um, it was a park that was a creation of a particular prince. It was in Prussia. It was between, now it's, now it's partly in, in Poland and it's partly in um, the, uh, the Germ in, in Germany. And um, it was one of the early examples of curvilinear streets in an irreg very irregular site. Next slide. Uh, the Prince Pukler Moscow, his name was, from 1785 to 1871, created in th this landscape and ran a school for landscape gardeners there from in the 1830s and the 1840s. Um, next slide. This is a detail of the upper part of the left-hand side of that plan, and it just shows how irregular. There's a river in the far right, on the lower right, 
Um, there, it, the, the dark spots are kind of downhill lower and in going into, uh, it looks like swampy area, but there are tablelands up above and there are curvilinear streets moving around uh, through this landscape of the park. Next slide. Ah, this, this is a really interesting one. This Pucker, Puckler Moscow did a, a three volume book in 1835 on landscape gardening. A lot of it devoted to his own garden, but just generally surveying this school of landscape design. And it, it, this oak bridge, oak branch bridge, as you can see, um, the word that comes to mind for me to describe it is rickety looking. Um, but it, there, this was a kind of bridge, this sort of um, wooden rustic bridge over ravines that showed up in Lake Forest later. We'll see a picture later. Next slide. Okay, back in the U.S. or in the, on the U.S. side of the Atlantic, um, at the Mount Auburn Cemetery, Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1931, there was this innovative rural, quote unquote, rural cemetery with its irregular terrain, curvilinear roadways and ponds introduced into the U.S. in a major way that that, that English landscape style garden and it was derived from its Chinese presence. So you can see the patterns that continue from the Chinese into the English and the French, and then into uh, American by the early uh, part of the 19th century. Next slide. Now this is a bad slide, but it's clear enough to see the patterns of the around contemporary early 1830s Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia. You can see some circular patterns, but the, basically you see the winding patterns through the cemetery. Next slide. Uh, now this is a more important one for us in Lake Forest. Uh, I'm not sure everybody can see it. It's over on the right. It says Greenwood Cemetery. And this was the suburban Brooklyn, New York's Greenwood Cemetery founded in 1838. It was so popular both as a park and as a place for burials uh, that they, made a, 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 they, they tripled the size with a big addition in 1842 by Zebedee Cook, who'd been working on the Mount Auburn Cemetery that we saw, and then young Elmer and Hotchkiss, who was the superintendent of the cemetery. So note the cir that there are there's the circular, there are curvilinear roads, but no circles. Uh, this distinctively here. And in 1840 to 42, Frederick Law Olmsted was farming in the area, Staten Island, and likely would have met Hotchkiss. Next slide. So now back across the Atlantic to um, Birkenhead Park and Suburb, 1836. And this is located across the Mersey River from Liverpool on the Northwest English coast. Here, William Paxton, landscape architect, designer, translated the estate form of English landscape as at Stourhead into a suburban upper middle class residential setting in and around a landscape park. By 1848 to 51, um, U.S. visitors, including Andrew Jackson Downing and F.L. Olmsted, were writing about Birkenhead in U.S. periodicals. So if you see the roadways, they're clear, the lakes are clear, but those dark places are clusters of buildings. Uh, so this was really a development um, for housing uh, with a great park in the middle. Next slide. Now, a steam ferry that went back and forth between Liberty and, 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 the, and the development uh, took, was in the 1830s. The steamer was a pioneer of transport technology, you know, with the steam that enabled having this garden suburb. Next slide. See the turning wheels there, yeah. So after Birkenhead, there's sort of a branching off that takes place in discussion of landscape history and garden city town planning. Scholars, just like uh, medical doctors, specialize in different areas. Uh, we're all used to that. This doctor doesn't do this, the other does, it, does something else. So this is true with these gardeners, these scholars of, of, of um, landscape and of town planning. Elizabeth Barlow Rogers' book here, 2001, on landscape design covers Prince's Park, a later version of Birkenhead. Um, and the, the, in her book though, stays with picturesque cemeteries and parks going forward, doesn't really explore the town part of it. Next slide. Now this book, which weighs 13 pounds, architect Robert A.M. Stern's book, 2013, is an exhaustive coverage in, of picturesque garden cities around the globe. 
Yet it's organized in a way that this focus on the evol- th- th- misses the focus on evolution of high technology, transport enabled suburban communities. It doesn't really focus on that. It talks for, first, it talks about enclaves or smaller places, subdivisions. Later, it talks about towns. Sometimes it drops towns in from behind. So it's, it, it doesn't follow a chronological order very well. Um, it does not relate either to um, the plans of, of, of grids, and we aren't showing a grid plan. Um, you can see that everybody knows what streets are like in Chicago, uh, that sort of thing. It doesn't cover, uh, the, the book, Robert A. M. Stern's book doesn't cover that. It doesn't cover parks. Um, and yet two of the people we're gonna talk about Adolf Strauch and Elmer and Hotchkiss, they took gigs that were across these boundaries. They were in town planning and also doing parks and doing um, cemeteries. So uh, it gets a little, you have to track them. It's kind of like hunting through the field. Next slide. Besides the steam driven ferry boat, the transport innovation that would make possible separation of city business careers and suburban family lifestyles was the smoke spouting locomotive. Next slide. Um, and here we have uh, A.J. Downing, who died in 1851 in, this, in, a, in a riverboat, a, a, a sort of a commuter riverboat explosion. Um, but in the 1840s, he was a very important promoter of country living with villas and landscape properties. He had, he especially liked Italian regular and irregular villas, and we'll see this popping up again. Next slide. So the city of Cincinnati was a typical American bustling, fast-growing urban area, densely populated with axial straight streets. So here we do see a straight street and five-story buildings. Plus, if you look carefully, you'll see it's kind of an unpleasant shoreline. Uh, next slide. Suburban Glendale of 1851 was 13 miles north of Cincinnati on a brand new railroad line and with the station you can see in the center right. Uh, the details here uh, were probably suggesting that this was worked on by a, a newly arrived in 1851 landscape gardener Adolf Strauch from um, most recently from London. And you can see on the right, or you can see that at the train station, going down from to the lower left, there's kind of a winding road that goes by a couple of ovals. And that was the best, uh, through that kind of curvilinear plan, uh, that was the best uh, example of a, of, a, of, a, of a sort of an arterial road heading to the station for people to follow. Next slide. So Spring Hill Seminary, Cemetery in Cincinnati, Ohio, 1856, is credited firmly to Adolf Strauch, who had arrived in, from London in 1851. And you can see circles at the top and the bottom kind of here um, with curvilinear roadways. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, Adolf Strauch had gone to Cincinnati in 1851 after meeting a Cincinnati businessman at the Crystal Palace exhibit in London, where Strauch Strauch was a landscape gardener. Strauch had studied at Puck, Puck, Puckler Moscow's park in Prussia. Next slide. He then had gone to London from Prussia to work at the Royal Botanic Garden there. Now notice how this garden's got circular paths, uh, curvilinear paths, circular forms, and scattered wooded character. Next slide. Uh, now here's that 1851 exhibit from an angle, I've, you've probably seen pictures of the inside that glass building that uh, William Paxson did also, but what's not so clear is to see how the landscape was so um, affected by circular ideas. And so you see that there is the big circular thing that's kind of like the Buckingham Fountain. Then there are semicircular kind of overlooks there. And then there are circular flower beds so we get the idea. Uh, next slide. Now Strauch's Spring Grove Cemetery, de this detail is showing the circular pattern in more detail. Next slide. Next slide. Ah, now here, this is from a later lithograph. And there's kind of a row of houses along there, you see. They're all Andrew Jackson Downing, um, regular Italian villas facing one of those ovals that we saw earlier in the, in the map. Uh, behind the, the, on the right side, the third one back there toward the top, 
That's an irregular villa. It's got a tower sticking up on top. Next slide. And here's this plan again. You can see the ovals there. Um, it was, I'm attributing it to this stroke. And even though it's attributed to the guy who was the surveyor who designed, who, who, who actually laid it out. But I think the designer was this stroke guy. Um, and it was the really, it made the town accessible. It was accessible by train daily for commuters to and from Cincinnati. And it was, it, it, it was on the way to being an anti-grid plan, anti-density, village-scaled, romantic, and pastoral community, not Cincinnati. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, so the, this, this is one of the most studied plans out there. This is Llewellyn Park, East Orange, New Jersey, 400 acres, 1854 to 57, it was developed. Uh, near New York City, but and accessible by train. But when you got to the his, his, his Hudson River, there were ferry boats again. So it was two different technologies to get you 10 miles from Manhattan. But this thrived. It was rich people on big lots, um, probably more like the scale of Glendale ones than the Lake Forest ones, but large lots. Next slide. Now this is a cemetery. Elmer and Hotchkiss, had, uh, by 1848, was at Belfontaine Cemetery in St. Louis uh, following a big cholera epidemic. And he designed that in 1848. Then by 1855, he went to Rock Island, um, Illinois and designed the Chipionic Cemetery there. Uh, we've visited it. Um, its setting is the north bank of the Rock River just before it enters the Mississippi with the entrance at the low point that you see down below there. It's a couple of buildings clustered around there at the entrance. Um, and then the roadways wind their way uphill. It's very picturesque, very interesting. It isn't steep like the Rocky Mountains, but it's a, it's a definite, it's a riverbank is what it is. Next slide. Now this is across the Atlantic again. This, there are two different places that were done, 1854 to 1858, we'll say. Um, the, at the bottom, I mentioned London. In Twickenham, there was a small suburb that the streets were kind of straight, but between them, they had um, sort of shared um, parkland in them too, uh, but a little more compressed for being so close to London. Now, this is outside of uh, Paris, Le Vesine, a small village plan with a larger layout for a loop in the Seine River. Uh, west of Paris, France, just a few miles. It's set in the grounds of an 18th century English landscape estate or park. Um, and it was uh, really taking advantage of something that was already well planted and everything there. So spread out around this, this plan here were a little bit more rustic villas on the edges. Next slide. Okay, back to our friend Frederick Olmsted. He was the author of articles on Birkenhead Park and, and its development um, around 1849-51 and focused on interesting people in doing a central park in New York City. The local uh, historian Edward Arpey, another founder of the Lake Forest Historical Society, Lake Forest Lake Bluff Historical Society, uh, in eight, and he wrote, wrote a book in 1963 and on page 35, although he's a little confused about some of the facts, um, he, and the timing, he credits Almstead in 1856 with referring the Lake Forest Association trustees, the group of Presbyterians in Chicago, who were trying to get out of the, the municipal area and going along the 1855 completed railroad. Um, they, we, he, Almstead referred them to Almer and Hotchkiss. He was down in St. Louis. He'd already done work in Illinois. So he was the closest person to work on this scale. Um, Olmsted could have known Hotchkiss in Brooklyn, as we said earlier, uh, when he was working on, Green, on Greenwood. Um, and this was a pioneering, Greenwood was a pioneering park-like open space. Next slide. So <clears throat> here's that summary view again, but simply to mention um, that, uh, to take a little look at it, it's about 1200 acres. So it's three times bigger than that Llewellyn Park subdivision. It's bigger than um, Glendale, it's big, it's big. And it's bigger than those ones in Europe. So um, Hotchkiss's north to south roadways wind across the ravines requiring bridges. And that's, so look at those deep ravines. This was a contemporaneous with an 1855 Niagara Gorge Bridge 
um, with a Niagara escarpment, um, giving those on the train that were crossing on the railroad bridge, passing over the gorge, a sensation of flying. Um, this was a sublime experience and was perhaps what Hotchkiss's motivation for, for wanting to kind of have, uh, for his very wealthy Chicago Presbyterian climb, clients, this experience crossing over these very deep ravines close to the lake. As they went by in a horse and buggy, they would feel like they were flying across this great space. And you could even get that sense today, driving down Mayflower Road, especially when you cross those great wide ravines that you're really up in the air. So next slide. Okay, the short lake forest from picturesque America, 1870s. Now this is to show from the bottom up what those uh, steep slopes looked like. And so when the, probably to the right was breaking into, uh, this was one of the ravines breaking through to the shore. Uh, they were deep and they were wide. Next slide. And this is the opposite view down from Forest Park, the begin, really the beginning point of the Lake Forest Plan in 1857. Uh, there's the new path in 2016, or taken in photograph of it in 2016, the year after it opened. And you can see the lake through there, but the, bl the bluff is kind of tall. So those ravines would have been deep. Next slide. And here's what we have to look at for a minute, because it's got a bunch of different things going on in it. There are four things to see. In the foreground, in the center, is the, the Harvey M. Thompson house. This is the, the most irregular of irregular Italian villas. Um, it's an Andrew Jackson Downing Villa with its pagoda and uh, right on the front of the building or right on this north side of the building. You know, the pagoda is a very much of a Chinese influence. And here we have in the very first days of Lake Forest, 1861, a house with a Chinese pagoda on it. And the, what's also remarkable is the doggone thing is still here. Um, somehow it's survived all the different fires, all the different owners, nobody's really taken down that to pagoda and said, nobody's wife has said, get rid of that thing, it looks funny. It's, it's a wonderful survival. It's one of the most important elements of a house in the Chicago area. Um, so where the camera is standing behind it would be the Presbyterian Church of 1862, uh, which was the center of the community. And Kitty Corner from the church was the academy. So this was the main corner, Deer Path Road going along there and um, Sheridan going north and south. At that time it was called University. Now I forgot to mention, see that in the front there's also a rickety bridge. Notice the rickety bridge. It looks just like that one we saw in, Puck, in Puckler Muscow's book. Um, and these weren't even cheap to do back then. So it was interesting. Probably there's a famous landscape architect who did that sculpted ravine there um, named William Saunders from the guy that did that Laurel Hill Cemetery earlier. Next slide. So now here highlighting shows, the highlighting shows Hotchkiss's 1857 circulation plan. See now we still have the, we have the two colors, the bright yellow and the bright red of my, my set game. Um, this plan is allowed for 285 lots with good sites on those downing, for those downing scale villas. Deer Path is the um, longitudinal red line. The red dashes are Sheridan or University at the time going up and down north to south. Solid yellow, that's where to concentrate now. Those are the crow's feet um, arterial things that were gathering people from the different parts of town and bringing to the station or distributing them from the station as quick as they could get home. Um, the street, this was, the street plan was planned to do that. So it's, it's, um, it's, it comes from Versailles. It comes from some of those earlier plans that we saw this, or, or Hampton Court uh, also the sort of thing. So this shows the crow's foot as very important in the, in the plan. And the center of town is where those two red lines come together. Um, the ones that needed bridges were Lake Road, Elm Road, and Mayflower of the, horizon, of the uh, up north to south other than University. And those all needed bridges. The, the, some of the people who were the lot owners actually shared their concerns about the absence of the bridges in the early days. They um, thought that perhaps the bridges should be being built faster. Uh, next slide. And this is just a little 
inset from the first ever published map of Lake Forest, 1861, a county map published in St. Louis. The train station is on the left at the train tracks there. And on the right is the Academy, oh. the Academy Park. Um, so you can see that all these buildings are there. North of the Academy Park is the Academy Boarding House built and opened in uh, March of 1859. And in, the, in, about 1870, in about 1869, it was moved two lots west, and it's now 725 Sheridan Road. Next slide. Now, several things went wrong in Lake Forest right around um, by 1868. The men's college level classes at the Academy building um, that first started in eight, as, as classes in 1861, ceased in 1863 when the patron, uh, Sylvester Lind, lost his fortune. And also by, eight, by the Gettysburg experience in, 18, in July of 1863, the town kind of emptied out. The guys went to be soldiers. Uh, other people went to do other things for the war effort. There was a female seminary founded in 1859, Reverend Dickinson. It closed in 1867 because he got sick. Um, got old and got sick. The Presbyterians decided after the war that they didn't require a whole bunch of different colleges that, that had different, they no longer, because they had different perspectives on slavery, that was no longer an issue in 1868. So they only were going to support the well-established ones with brick buildings, which happened to be Beloit College, right by the Illinois state line, um, over by Rockford, and then uh, in Galesburg, Knox College. So um, basically the idea of the fledgling university with its collegiate department at Lake Forest was toast. Uh, and all that was really gonna continue was the academy at that point. Um, and then the other thing was the building of the bridges over the ravines, which was turning out to be a major expense even for flimsy ones. And so these things all were kind of stacking up against the town. Next slide. So these problems led to three reactions I'm gonna point out. First. Veteran East Coast landscape gardener W or H. Oh. W. S. Cleveland, and a partner in 1867, um, with a partner in 1867, planned Highland Park, five miles south of Central Lake Forest. Their layout avoided having north-south arteries crossing over those deep ravines close to the lake. Next slide. Now this is pretty Highland Park. This is a map from 1872 of Highland Park. The plan is five years old. Um, you can see a nice, in the middle kind of of the plan, you can see a nice bright spot. That means it's kind of tableland. But south and north of it are these big um, ravines. Next slide. So here's a view with my state-of-the-art flow pen graphics uh, showing the straight, diagonal, and gently curving arterial roadway circulation that went to and from the train station in Highland Park in 1867. Um, the roadways follow the tablelands between the ravines. They do not, later, Highland Park built ravines, but or bridges over the ravines. But early on, they did everything they could to avoid doing that. Next slide. This is a later suburb, 1869, 18, 18, the 1982 map of Riverside, Illinois, showing its street plan inserted into a flat terrain along the Des Plaines River with a big loop in it, very picturesque, in a horseshoe curve uh, in the river, very picturesque with like Vezinay, which was in similar kind of a loop um, near Paris a decade earlier. Omstead streets in Riverside, which he planned, um, they were more curvilinear than some of the other ones, though less so than Lake Forest. The plan originally extended uh, to the, off, the, off the screen to the left there, um, significantly to the west of the river, but because of the river, they never really developed fully, and it was replaced by a kind of straight street, just community leader. So Riverside is all east of the river. Next slide. So meanwhile, back at the ranch, a second reaction to the Lake Forest slump, Olmsted in Chicago, <clears throat> considering to plan Riverside, visited Lake Forest in 1868, the year before his plan, designing two features for estates found in town at its, in, at its um, 160 years history's nadir or lowest point. 
Almost everything at the educational operation was closing. The population post-war was still down. In his 1868 report to the Riverside group of people planning that town, um, Olmsted writes this, that the city of Chicago as yet has no true suburbs or quarters in which urban and rural advantages are agreeably combined with any prospect of long continuance. So he's referring to dying Lake Forest. Basically, that's the old bit for Lake Forest that he wrote in 1868, trying to get this gig for 1869 in Riverside. Next slide. So once again, with my dazzling graphics, note Riverside's principal north-south arteries in red and subsidiary ones in yellow. Most of the streets indeed feed directly to the station, um, even more so than in Lake Forest. Just, um, just left and below the center of the map, the little red circle was the station. Now the, the, re the Riverside lots were smaller, um, make, makes it easier for him to do that. They were, um, instead of being two acres, they would maybe have been a quarter of an acre or a half an acre. Um, and um, previously the best organized large town plan with curvilinear in the streets and a picturesque plan had been Lake Forest, which Amstead had just visited. Next slide. A third reaction to Lake Forest plight. By 1873, after designing Highland Park and other projects in the region, Cleveland wrote his book called Landscape Architecture as Adapted to the Needs of the West or Wants of the West. And is a chapter, a whole chapter on town planning in the West. Without ever naming Lake Forest, he urges his readers to avoid expensive sites and exposures, to strive for economy and new garden city plans. And so he didn't mention Lake Forest at all. Next slide. Um, back at the farm, uh, the Inwensia Club got started in, um, in 1895 on a, in, a, in a big house built by um, Henry Ives Cobb. Next slide. And the town started to grow as a result, moving beyond that. And down at the bottom there, you'll see that the part that hadn't been settled, that was south in Moraine Township, because it was too far for people to walk to church since the, 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 firm, the Orthodox religionists didn't want to hitch up a horse on Sunday. It was work. So the southern part didn't develop, but it did develop starting in, um, in 1894-96 with a couple of big developers. By 1900 to 1905, there were several estates going west and north. Next slide. And this is one of those big slides, Warren Manning's uh, landscape architect's design for the Walden Estate. And the bottom line down there is the southern end of the Lake Forest original 1857 plan developed after 1895 and in the 20th century. Next slide. This is not following the plan at all, but between that southern end of Lake Forest and the northern part of the 1887 founded Fort Sheridan was the um, um, Edith Rockefeller McCormick really Italian villa. Now the interesting thing about that villa is it didn't thrive. By the 30s, it was um, just being left alone. Uh, by the 1950s, it was redesigned in a plan that was more like uh, Walden and like Lake Forest above it. So time, the Lake Forest plan actually won out in the long run. And this was done by Marshall Johnson, 1950s, um, and for Villa Turicum. Next slide. And this kind of shows it on, the, um, on a map. Uh, it's the spread of the curvilinear plan south. The, the, along the dotted line, that's the township line. Um, Wald, first, uh, just below that was a part of the property, a part of the town plan that was developed as cars hit in 1904. Then the Walden property was divided, subdivided in 1930s and 50s. That's why and then right. Villa Turcum was subdivided and worked on in the 1950s as well. So next slide. Uh, north of Lake Bluff was the uh, Shore Acres estate following the same plan around a golf course. Um, this was considered uh, Lake Forest, quote unquote, in the code language of society pages, meaning Anuencia members of states. Next slide. And this is the Knollwood Club, 1925. Um, up to late 176, it went on w Waukegan Road, a subdivision plan around the Knollwood Club golf course, new in 1925. 
um, North Waukegan Road. And Edward H. Bennett, the planner, laid this out to wind around the fairways with Hotchkiss scaled over two acre lots. And, and, and Bennett was the person who had done the zoning for Lake Forest, started the first plan commission both in the 20s, and then also um, was the planner for Grant Park, um, the river walks, that sort of thing, and co-author of the 1909 plan of Chicago. Thank you. Next slide. So this is my final slide. Now this is on the right is David Mattoon's 2014 reconstructed plan with enlarged lot numbers there that you see, uh, just showing here the Shields Township portion of the plan. Um, and so these were the lots where people could walk to church from. And the whole point of this development of the, showing these different patterns is that Riverside was not the first garden city. Uh, this review shows that it was at the end of a long development um, that Lake Forest, with its largest garden city town plan in Europe or America in 1857, played a key role in the evolution of new technology transport enabled suburbs outside of major cities. Hotchkiss's well organized crow's foot arterial system was a crucial link. Thank you very much. Order. Anybody awake? Good. Smile if you're awake. Well, Art, that was really interesting. <laughs> Good. So um, I'm going to help uh, facilitate questions. So you can unmute and ask a question if you'd like, or you can hit the chat um, and type a question in. Um, and to get us started, um, I guess, you know, one of my first questions is, so with the curvilinear design, I know you and I have talked about the fact that part of the goal is to create privacy, yes. right? It's yes. sight lines for the property. It's a way to create sort of a romantic sort of vista. You know, I know we've all experienced blind corners, trying to drive them with cars, Um <laughs> But we don't we don't really know why um, the town folks picked um, Hotchkiss. We, we can well, it's in the minutes. We don't know why, but it's in the minutes, right? Yeah, right. That he was chosen. Yeah. They were. I think they were. Um, they did. I think they really liked the secretive idea. The lots are about the same size as lots on the north side of the Chicago River that are were originally were blocks. You know. Uh, that had streets on four sides. Uh, they're about the same size as those. And the houses built were about the same size as those original houses in the 1850s that you had there. So they were trying to recreate that. But there were, I didn't go into this whole other part of it, but there is, part of the reason for the privacy was everybody got to Chicago about the same time, 1830s and 40s. And people who were rich by the 1850s, how can I put this? There were people who were not just jealous, but a little suspicious of how they got rich so fast when they all, maybe I hadn't gotten rich so fast. Um, so they chose to be out on the railroad line. Uh, that was one reason. Another was about slavery. Um, there were complicated issues about slavery and lifestyle that made the uh, Presbyterians and, and basically the Protestants want to um, move to the suburbs and not compete or not enforce blue laws in the city um, in the pre-Civil uh, War period because they wanted to keep the liberal Germans on their side um, for the anti-slavery cause before the Civil War. So that was another reason why they wanted to leave. Why they wanted to go there, they came from hilly, godforsaken farmland in upper New York State in New England and places like that, or if they were Scots-Irish, they came from um, down in uh, Tennessee. That was Dr. Patterson, who was one of the founders of the community, came from Tennessee. Um, but they left the area because of slavery. Um, and then the Scots themselves, they're famous hill people, you know. Mm -hmm. So we had, uh, with, between the New Englanders and the Lake Foresters, you had the two most clannish groups um, almost in um, Northern European American society. Uh, so these things came together so that they liked that picturesque landscape and they wanted a street plan that would be appropriate for it. 
Well, and one of the things I know you mentioned it briefly in passing, though, is that, you know, um, River Forest gets all this credit for being the first curvilinear planned community because they marketed it. Yes. Like they took those maps. They were out there selling that. And you see, the Lake Foresters, the, what the last thing they wanted is people to know they were. <laughs> yeah. they, it's you had to know somebody to get a lot, you know, um, it was an entirely different business model. Um, it isn't that they weren't for sale, but they were for sale to a particular group. Uh, and there, I think they used a lot of um, word of mouth. There was a, a Lake Forest Association pamphlet that was distributed at the time, but I think it would have been through the churches. And there was, at that time, there was a the second Presbyterian church is where this was organized in the city. There was a first Presbyterian church. There was a fourth Presbyterian church up on the north side. There was a third Presbyterian church on the west side. And so these folks all were, um, they didn't need anybody else. Mm -hmm. Well, or in the Chicago saying, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. Exactly. Yeah. So how many of the early residents would have been Chicagoans relocating and how many would have come from elsewhere directly? Come from elsewhere directly. Well, the escaped slaves came out from elsewhere directly. They came through on the, on the Underground Railroad then they, most of them made their way to Canada, uh, maybe going through Waukegan or Kenosha or something just like that. Uh, they liked it. They came back. In the 1870 census, the neighborhood around Washington Road in Illinois, um, it was the colored neighborhoods. Everybody's listed as colored. And they ask them where they last lived, and they say Canada. So um, they, they, first they came from the south, and then they came from Canada. Otherwise, they, um, the workers came from Ireland, um, mostly initially, and later they came from Scandinavia and other parts of Great Britain. Um, but initially, that was kind of the pattern. The, um, the, the, the people themselves came mostly from New England. I would say that would be the largest contingent, and, and Scots, mm -hmm. who came through Chicago. Chicago and Scots. Yeah. All right, so we have a question. Um, in the 1920s, Illinois community started enacting zoning ordinances. Oh, yeah. The first zoning ordinance in Lake Forest helped codify the curvilinear plan with large lots? It helped keep business out of it. Um, the that Holt, who had the regular Italian villa we saw in the picture, he said when he went to build that house, I'm not going to build my house if you have any businesses on the east side of the tracks. So there were a couple of businesses, and, at le and one of them at least moved to the other side of the tracks. And that's where why Western Avenue developed as the business section. But um, the zoning was to keep, so part of the zoning, and Ted Bennett's here someplace, he can correct me, but if you'll notice the zoning line uh, for the Green Bay Road District, it goes uh, just a half a block, the other side of, uh, on the east side of um, Green Bay Road. Uh, Bennett's house was at the corner of Green Bay and uh, deer path on the west side of the road. So he was kind of interested in not having a gas station built across the street from his house, I think. So that, and he was uh, with everybody else. He was designing that plan to, to, to kind of have these estate areas not encroached on by businesses. Well, and at that point, like how big would the, the business sector district would have really only been like a handful of buildings? Because I know by 1890, you start to get what people in some of the Lake Forest um, newspapers refer to as the shanty town, yeah. where some of the workers lived. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they had, uh, I mean, since the beginning, there had been um, quote unquote urban renewal going on with areas that weren't so attractive. And especially after the golf club was started in 1895 and, and families started coming out, they would be going through some of these ramshackle districts and thinking, and they just did, by 1909, they had just uh, paid for, a lot of the people who were involved, the plan for Chicago of 1909. And then they would, all the beautiful things were gonna happen there and they got to Lake Forest and it looked like a dog's breakfast, you know. Um, <laughs> they went through, they went through, the, they went past what we now think of as, where the Deer Path Inn is. That was a small neighborhood of, of kind of shanties. Um, and so there was a lot of stimulus at that point to clean up. And the, there was the, the organization that bought Western Avenue to make Market Square was called the Lake Forest Improvement Trust. 
So this was part of the reform era. And um, what we do, we're only now realizing how much it wasn't just making everything bigger and better and better looking. It did kind of marginalize some um, citizens, people of color, uh, to that neighborhood around Washington and Illinois, mm -hmm. and also up to um, Sp uh, Spruce Avenue. Well, and I know that there was some discussion around how much people would be doing their shopping there. Well, you had, right. to, you had to lure them there. And of course, the, the biggest customers after the 1895, as the estates went in, were the support community. Um, the people who were doing all the work in town, and this became, the real town became the support community because the people who owned the big estates lived in Chicago. They voted in Chicago. And um, this, the, the town of Lake Forest from um, 1900, let's say, until 1930, probably, was largely the people who were the supporters. Just like in, if you go to a lake resort town, you know, um, they're the people who live there all the time and then the people who don't. Uh, my grandfather lived in one of those towns and he said, yeah, the store raises the prices every um, June and forgets to take them down in September, you know. Um, but I mean, those kind of communities were just built around the leisure people with, this, with, with cottages or whatever. Well, that was, you know, when we were doing the research on the 20 and the 20s, one of the most interesting things around sort of what they were marketing is sometime in the 1920s, people move up to Lake Forest and they stay. It's really the first time that I think it becomes sort of full-time residencies for a lot of the folks. And then they start marketing in the Lake Forester to have your winter apartment back down in Chicago to try to sell some of the buildings that had become relatively unoccupied, some of the luxury apartments. Well now, the, but remember now, those there's only buildings in a little bit of Lake of, of Chicago. The buildings are built on East Lakeshore Drive and Lakeshore Drive up to about a little past Fullerton. That was it. There was Astra Street behind it maybe, a couple of blocks in and you got in trouble. So, um, that was because the lake breezes coming off the lake were strong enough to fight off the breezes from the, uh, or the certain je ne sais quoi that came from the stockyards. And a few people in the pictures here look like they might possibly remember what that smelled like. Anybody remember what the stockyard smelled like? There we go. See, it was, um, I remember my first experience of it. It was sort of indescribable. And I came from rural Michigan, some of the, in the summers anyway, I was used to farms. This was not a farm smell. This was way worse. And so their apartments for winter time, they would, um, would be on, on Lakeshore Drive. Right. Well, and that and was the one that, the one I remember seeing the marketing for was the sunrise and the sunset of which I think only one of those buildings remains. And it's the one right at the end of Lakeshore Drive that has the pink on it. And at that point- Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, sure. it's been a summer resort at the edge of Chicago. Right, yeah. And then when people started summering and then spending their year in Lake Forest, then they had to come up with a reason to go live at the edge of the city where you would have been far north of any of that odor and you still would have had like um, views and lake access. Yeah, so that, that neighborhood up there, the lake view up down as farther you went, safer you were from- um, a bad surprise. I mean, this is before air conditioners. So you had to have your windows open from mid-April. Um, so, okay, you know, you had to sometimes have the windows open from mid-April into November, maybe. And you didn't want to do that if you lived farther down, if you had a choice. Any other questions from the audience? <laughs> I was wondering, um, Art, and I may have uh, missed it, actually, you may have said, but um, you mentioned that Olmsted was in Lake Forest to work on two estates, and I was wondering which estates uh -huh. these were. Yeah, I was rattling along a little fast there, sorry. Um, the two estates where there are fairly credible reports from family members or people who were present, if not right at that time, very soon after, were, there was a pond on the Charles B., Farwell Estate. He was a congressman and a senator. Um, he had a pond. It's not there anymore. It got filled in in the 50s when the estate was broken up. But there are pictures of it. Um, I'm sure they, that Lori uh, Stein could find a picture of that. Um, from the Yeah, you got it. And the other one was the, um, the Holt House Estate 
That was the regular Italian villa that was the one to the left of the irregular one with the pagoda. You can tell these guys had different personalities. You know, the square one, he was square, he was straight. And then the other one was a little more, you know, what's coming up next, you know. So um, they did have, uh, you know, different patterns there. So, but that would have had a pretty straightforward design. But the front yard uh, used to have a um, two, a two curb cut drive that went in front of the house. Uh, and then there is, still is a pot that's at that, at that house. So if you look there, you'll see it. And that was the family. It was the daughter of the family who um, reported that. It was a professor at the college who reported the, the Olmsted story, but also the uh, daughter of the Farwells wrote about, the, about Olmsted being there. So those two states. And a couple of questions. Um, what was the maximum African American population in town? That's a good question. That's a good question. There might have been at least thirty houses around Illinois and Washington at one point, and they they got started having urban renewal, eighteen ninety two, um, clearing out some of that stuff. Um, it's always been a fluid population, so some were coming in in the seventies. Others were probably leaving by the 90s. And so different waves came from the South at different times. So we do, I, I think we'd have to check the census records in, in detail. It's a good question. There was a neighborhood up at Spruce Avenue. Um, that was pretty early also. And then there was the neighborhood where the Deer Path Inn is, but then other, maybe other people around there too. So if you had, let's say you had 50 houses, you might have had 150 people, but in the size of the town that it was at that point, that was quite a few people. And concentrated in two or three areas, unlike yeah, right. uh, yeah. Another thing is, I, I seem to remember, Lori may also know this, there were a number of ponds in town that no longer exist, right? So from early days until maybe even into the 40s, early 50s, some of these ponds were still in existence around. Uh, There's still some. There's a couple. Uh, one as pond as there were, though, right? Pardon? Not as many as there were at once. No, but there are two kettle ponds that I know about. Kettle ponds are left over after the glaciers go recede, and there's these kind of round. They can be lake size or they can be smaller. One is at the on the northwest corner, roughly, of um, Green Bay Road and Westminster. Uh, back in there, there's a there's a really nice old pedal, kettle pond that we know has been there from the earliest maps, and then there is a pond. Um, south of Route 60, uh, west of uh, Ridge Road, um, that's between West Wesley and Route 60. And there's another kettle pond there. Those are ones that I do know are still existing. I know not existing is that one that's at, that was at the, the CB Farwell Estate that was beautiful, beautifully landscaped. Thanks. Great. Any other questions? All right, Bob. You, you unmute here. Can you unmute? How's there. that? Perfect. Our, there's a touch of Lake Forest in Glencoe and Winnetka. Just off of Sheridan Road and north of the ravines is about a 30 acre stretch of uh, winding streets, very much in the Lake Forest style. Okay. They, were laid, they were laid out by Jared Gage, who was one of the first parents at Lake Forest Academy. So he would have been in touch with Lake Forest and might have been inspired by it when he laid out the uh, Glencoe um, subdivision. Yeah, now the Winnetka one was, I think they bought that land before, I think that was already sold that land when the, when the Lake Foresters organized. I don't know about Glencoe when that was first organized. Um, Jared Gage came out in 1857 and he laid oh. that picturesque out in 1872. Okay, so... Just after yeah. Glencoe was, was incorporated, in fact. Yeah. So because this, the site was similar to Lake Forest, um, so those streets are west of Sheridan or east of Sheridan? East of Sheridan, and there's a little bit of a crow's foot that comes out okay. uh, of, of, of a minor variety, but the, clearly inspired by something like Lake Forest. The Winnetka portion of that was developed by Gilbert Hubbard and the surveyor there was William French. Yeah, that's the same guy that worked in Hound Park, yeah. 
with Cleveland, yes. Yeah, right. Now, um, the, the big book I mentioned, the, the Robert A.M. Stern book that's like this thick and weighs about 13 pounds, um, that I probably has Glencoe in it. And I just, I'll have to look and make sure that that's true. Um, he records just about every single subdivision that ever got built with curvilinear streets. So I bet you it's there and I just didn't cover it. Yeah. Um, but, and he said it was 1872. So I kind yeah. of, I kind of end at 1870. But, um, and my wife sitting next to me would have kicked me if I went too far off stage anyway <laughs> on the time frame here. So <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thank you, Art. Good question. Good, question. Good suggestion. Um, you mentioned Jen Jensen. Yeah. Did you do a lot of um, landscaping in the Lake Forest area? It, yeah, and I think I saw that the um, the notes were up on this someplace. That there are about forty places in Lake Forest, Lake Bluff, that are identified as Jensen landscapes. Now, and those, of course, would be the clients that were named at the time, and that. They would be big parcels and now they're divided, subdivided. The difficult thing about any of Jens Jensen's landscapes are that they were um, so naturalistic looking that they looked like, uh, how can I say this politely, vacant lots later in, or areas to subdivide. They weren't appreciated for what they were. The way that Jensen really survives in Lake Forest is the way it's been recreated in the um, late 20th century, early 21st century, at open lands, um, on some property, on private properties, a little bit at Lake Forest College, um, where there's native prairies have been brought back, that sort of thing. But um, unfortunately, most of his stuff didn't make it. It's well, and he also, I mean, one of his biggest influences, I think, was the fact that he started the clubs they were yes. really focused on prairie restoration. And I think that it's early on, more than 50 Lake Foresters are members of that club and sort of commit to the idea of naturalized landscape. And out of that, you start getting the preservation of some of the prairie plants. So even though some of the designs might not last, a lot of the um, presence of um, some of the heirloom plants are driven by his initiatives early on in this area. Sure. A good example would be the Shaw Prairie that this open lands has behind Ragdale to the west of Ragdale. And the farmer that had lived there before they bought it um, from the 1830s to 1898, he didn't, um, he was not very industrious perhaps or didn't drain the lower part down by the river, the, down by the Skokie. So a student in the, in the 1960s came and did a study and figured out that that was all virgin prairie down there. It never had a plow. Um, there's more restored prairie on that property now, but there was actually native prairie there. There's also in Westlake Forest behind or west of Waukegan Road, there's native prairie on different properties. So yes, I think you're right. Um, and a lot of it, I mean, there must be 800 acres that's saved by open, Lake Forest open lands. And Jensen was promoting that. He was promoting uh, forest preserves. Uh, the city um, got forest preserves, or the, around Chicago in, Lake, in Cook County, they had forest preserves much earlier, you know, in the teens maybe. Uh, up here, it didn't come, in, in Lake County, it didn't come until I think 1959, something like that. They passed a, a law to create the forest preserve district and it's, it's expanded since then. But by that time, the cat was out of the bag a little bit. All right, any other questions? I know we've gone a little over time. All right, if not, what I'd like to do is say thank you to Art for another fascinating program. That was great. <laughs> um, Alex, do you wanna talk a little about some of our upcoming programs before we say goodbye? And again, Art, really interesting. If you wanna see some of the maps that he was showing and some of the information, come on in and see the exhibit at the museum. Yep. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at some of the other MAP programs. Alex, what's coming up? 
Well, Carol, next on our docket, we're going to have um, our first in-person program coming up. We're very excited to have people back in the museum. So on July 8th, we're going to be having a program on the Chicago to Mackinac Yacht Race, which should be um, a lot of fun. This is a group we've had in before, and they're backed by popular demand. So that will be, again, July 8th. Um, we're doing a tour of the gardens at 900. This is the Craig Bergman property, and that's going to be on July 15th. We're offering two tours, one at 10 a.m. and one at 2, and this is sort of a two-for-one deal because afterwards we're encouraging everyone to go over to Eloa, where you're, you're going to get a second tour of that property. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of MAPS programming, our next MAP program will be July, um, will be coming up July 29th, and that's um, Actually, we have one before that, but we're still uh, in the planning stages. But July 29th, we have What's in a Name with Sarah Salto from the Lake County Forest Preserves. And we're going to be talking about some of the name origins in Lake County. So should be a lot of fun. You can read all about those on our website and we hope you'll be able to come in and join us. And thank Thanks you again for, for tuning in. And thank you again, Art. Thank you. <laughs>